I'm Harlan Krumholtz, Editor-in-Chief of the American College of Cardiology Lifelong Learning Portfolio. I'm here today to talk to you a bit about the new cholesterol guidelines and to bring some clarification to some of the information since there's so much attention being directed to these new guidelines. They represent such a direct change in controversies emerging about some of the decisions that are connected with the new recommendations that are coming down the pike. I think the best way to think about these guidelines is to focus on several of the new themes, principles, that have emerged from these guidelines. These guidelines have moved to de-emphasize targets, lipid levels, which are really surrogates for a patient's risk. The thought previously was that if we just focus singularly on these lab values, pushing them down by any means necessary, we're benefiting patients. Recent studies have shown us that the strategy by, with you, by which you address these lipid levels may have important implications for the benefit for patients. There are some drugs that can favorably modify lab tests, but do not benefit patients in the long run. This has led us to realize that this singular focus on labs can misdirect us. It also led to the recognition that these drugs all have thousands of effects, and following a single lab value may lead us to a false impression about what it does for the patient. It doesn't impugn the cholesterol hypothesis or the knowledge that cholesterol plays a critical role in the pathogenesis of heart disease but it does humble us with regard to the way in which we may try to change cholesterol levels and modify risk. We ultimately need to prove it. And these guidelines are endorsing the idea that you need that proof in order to know that you have actually helped patients. That is, by making their lab tests look better, you have not actually necessarily helped them unless you used a drug which has been shown to benefit them. So the second theme is focus on drugs that work. The emphasis in this guideline is on statins, the idea being that this is the class of drugs for which there is the strongest evidence, for which we have the most assurance that they not only lower cholesterol, but they actually lower risk. Whatever the range of effects that these drugs have, in addition to their effect on cholesterol, do not offset that benefit. They may even potentiate that benefit. And many people have written about these other potential pleiotrophic, so-called pleiotrophic effects, perhaps anti-inflammatory effects, for example that may actually go in the same direction as lipid lowering and end up benefiting patients. So first thing, we moved from the singular focus on the lab test. Second, a focus on proven medications. And then a third piece, which has turned out to be a bit controversial, but the principle is good no matter what. And that is we only ought to be treating patients who have the most to gain. And in fact, we ought to be enlisting patients in the conversation because what I think is worthy of treatment may be different than what my patient thinks is worthy of treatment, may be different from what the next patient thinks is worthy of treatment. So this really entails a discussion, but the general principle of saying we need to consider the size of the benefit, that is, the patient's actual risk. So this guideline emphasizes that. It says, if you're very high risk, if you've had heart disease, if your cholesterol is remarkably elevated, and they set that level at 190 milligrams per deciliter, then treatment is indicated, is recommended. Again, I should never say dictated or mandated because it's a shared decision, but it's recommended. If you don't have those, then they ask, do you have diabetes? And in this guideline, then they suggest that patients who have diabetes would benefit from treatment, and then they go through a risk calculator to try to find a threshold, and they suggest 7.5% over 10 years as being the kind of level that you should be treated. Now, there's a lot of discussion recently about whether the risk calculator that accompanied these guidelines provides accurate estimates. There's a lot of discussion about whether all diabetics should be treated, and there's discussions about what the proper threshold should be. These discussions are likely to lead to a public dialogue, which may lead to refinements in the approach and recommendations in the future. But the general principles that underlie these guidelines are unlikely to change. They're unlikely to change. That is, move away from a singular focus on a single lab test, use proven medications, and in this case, a lot of non-statin drugs, like azetamide, have yet to be proven. Focus on the meds that work, and try to help people understand what the size of the benefit is for them. Make a decision so that those who have the most to gain are the ones most likely to be treated. Now, we'll be discussing the details for quite some time, whether this risk calculator is the right one, what's the right threshold for treatment, how do we engage patient, how do we make wise choices. But these three principles, these, these really represent advances over our past approach where we were singularly looking at lab values. We included some aspects of risk, but we were very permissive about the drugs that we were using. So this advantage, away from the, drug, away from the lipid levels, drugs at work, 
focus on how much to gain, that's an advantage. <laughs>